Hi, uh, my name is Mark Ebert uh, from the Mayo Clinic, uh, and I'm excited uh, to join you all today and to share some of our recent research. <clears throat> and what we're focusing on is uh, how long-range technologies uh, help resolve complex genomic regions that are often overlooked by shortly read sequencing. So, you know, as as we all know, short read sequencing uh, has many. Uh, applications and a lot of value, but there are certain aspects uh, in our research that that are really, really lend themselves better to uh, long read sequencing. And I want to highlight some of that today. So basically, short reads, they overlook two critical types of genomic variants uh, that that we believe are, are really important uh, in human health and disease. And those two basic categories <clears throat> are first variants that fall in what are called dark or what we uh, in, in certain situations term camouflaged regions. And I'll go more in depth about what that is here in a moment. Uh, the second category of genomic variants that is often overlooked by, by short reads are structural variants. And those are generally categorized as variants that include at least 50 contiguous nucleotides. Um, and so what I'm showing here in, in the, the image to the to the left is uh, is a large structural uh, deletion in the CR1 gene uh, that we uh, are able to uh, monitor and, and, and measure with the bio nanogenomics optical mapping DNA mapping technology. And on the right we're showing a large uh, 2100 base pair deletion that we observed in the in the gene with with uh, long, long read technologies. So let's talk for a minute about what exactly dark and camouflage regions are, and you know, do we care? You know, that long read technologies can resolve them. Like why why should we care? So what exactly is a are these dark regions? So. Uh, we we categorize them into two basic groups of dark by depth or dark by mapping quality. So with dark by depth, uh, that's basically a region of the genome that when we sequence you know an individual's DNA, we don't get uh, reads at that region. There just are no reads. <clears throat> and that, an example that we're showing here is HLA DRB5, where in many individuals, this region is is at least or approximately 50% dark in coding regions. And you can see this in the, the blank areas the where there are no reads. And just to kind of orient you, what we're looking at is a pile up of, of short Illumina reads for an individual where each little gray bar represents uh, an individual read. And and, and tr uh, typically what you would expect is to see a, a nice deep pile up of these reads as you see at the beginning of the gene. But as you get deeper into the gene, you see these large gaps where there just are no reads. So that's dark by depth. The, uh, the second category is what we call dark by mapping quality. And this is a very different scenario, but has the same end result where basically you cannot get, you cannot observe or measure variants or mutations in these regions. Uh, so with dark by mapping quality, what's happening, uh, as you can see with, within HSP A1A, at the beginning of the gene, we see a lot of nice gray bars deeply stacked, and those the gray bars indicate that it's aligned uh, well by the aligner. And as you get deeper into the gene, you see these sort of transparent bars, which are reads that are aligned but have a mapping quality of zero. And so the aligner didn't know how to handle these reads, and we'll talk about why in a moment. But later when the structural, or excuse me, when the variant collar is coming along looking for mutations, it sees this entire pile of reads that have a poor mapping quality and it just ignores them. So in both of these situations, whether it's dark by depth or dark by ma mapping quality, the, the variant collar, as it comes along, just it completely ignores these regions and does not you know, indicate to you, or, or you, you know, your VCF file does not indicate that, uh, or your list of variants does not indicate that, that these regions are, are completely overlooked. <clears throat> so uh, 
Talking specifically more about the dark by mapping quality, these are the regions that we call camouflaged. And the reason we, that, that we consider them camouflaged is they're, they're dark by mapping quality because of a genomic duplication. So what's happening here, we're showing an example of HSPA1A and HSPA1B that are two genes just down the road from each other in the genome. And they're uh, nearly identical through about half of the genes. And you can visually see the, the transparent bars very, very, you know, immediately which region is, is camouflaged. And what's happening is these genes are camouflaging each, each other. So when we, we use short reads uh, and you get a read that can align equally well to two or more places, the aligner doesn't know where to put it. And so it randomly assigns it to one of those locations and gives it a mapping quality of zero. Uh, and then, you know, has the downstream consequences that we previously discussed. So that's what camouflage genes are. So, the, you know, the big question was we, in our research, we started to bump into some genes that we felt were, uh, or we knew were important with our research in uh, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, frontal temporal dementia, and uh, we were kind of surprised that, that they were dark uh, or camouflaged. And so that really got us thinking, you know, how big is this problem? Uh, so I should, I should state that, that, you know, in genomics, in the field of genomics and bioinformatics, we've known for years that, that there were regions like this. We knew that the problem existed, but no one really knew how big the problem was. And so, you know, as we started to see some important genes that are being affected, we decided we needed to, to dig into this and see how big the problem is. So when we did that, uh, we found that over 6,000 gene bodies are at least partially dark, uh, according to, based on HG38 reference genome. 527 of those are completely dark from end to end. And that really surprised us. So we then started to dig in to get you know more details. You know what kind of gene bodies are these, and what areas of a gene. <clears throat> um, before I get to that, um, uh, here I'm showing a a plot of percent darkness for each gene. So uh, on the on the y-axis is percent darkness, and on the x-axis is each gene in rank order based on the darkness. And as I mentioned, 527 genes are completely dark. Uh, if we set a threshold of at least 25% dark, there are over 1,600. And over 2,100 are at least 5% dark. But you know, as I mentioned, the, the big question then for us was, okay, what kind of gene bodies are these? Gene bodies is, is a fairly vague term. <clears throat> so uh, when we looked at uh, gen code, uh, classifications, we determined, we were able to determine that almost 4,000 of these 6,000 gene bodies are actually protein coding, uh, followed by pseudogenes, link RNAs, and various other RNAs. So this surprised us. We did not expect most of them to be protein coding. Um, so then we determined, then we wanted to know, okay, what, which area of a protein coding gene or other genes, gene bodies is most affected? And unsurprisingly, the the bulk of them were intronic, as you see in the uh, bar plot to the right. <clears throat> and uh, followed by introns were exons from non-coding RNAs, and then actual coding regions, CDS regions, and then followed by 5' prime and 3' prime UTRs. So while we're not surprised that the, the majority of these regions are intronic, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, I think a lot of researchers tend to discredit the importance of introns in, in biology, but there are actually a lot of disease-causing mutations that are intronic, uh, such as the C9ORF72 G4C2 repeat uh, expansion, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later in my presentation. <clears throat> so um, from from here on in my uh uh, in my talk, I'm going to describe and focus mostly on the coding regions, genes that are affected where at least 5% of the coding exons are dark or camouflaged. 
So <laughs> zeroing in on those, uh, we found that 117 genes are 100% dark in coding regions, and almost 600 genes are at least 5% dark in coding regions. So again, narrowing down and, and, and zooming in on these uh, genes that are at least 5% dark, you know, we wanted to know what, what pathways, what uh, gene families might be involved in this. And, uh, and we were surprised and found that there are some, some really important uh, pathways that are affected that are where at least 5% of a gene, the coding region, is overlooked. And these pathways are relevant to human health and development and even reproductive function, um, as you can see. We also uh, wanted to look and see, you know, are any of these particular genes known to uh, interact directly, physically? Uh, and some of these genes do, including HSPA1A and, and some other important genes. <clears throat> so then the big question for us was, okay, we've, we've determined that there are a lot of protein coding and other, and other gene bodies that are completely overlooked, or at least partially overlooked, when we're doing short read sequencing. Uh, so how many of these genes are already known to be involved in human disease? And we found that 76 genes that are at least 5% dark in CBS regions have known mutations that are associated with human disease, uh, in this case, 326 unique human diseases. And what I'm showing is a word cloud uh, of these 76 genes where the size of the gene uh, in, in this figure indicates the number of diseases that, that it's known to be involved in. So for example, NEB is involved in over 24 human diseases, including mammaline myopathy. And uh, there are some, some of these genes that I'm gonna focus on, but you. You, know, you might be wondering now, is my favorite gene uh, partially dark or camouflaged? And this is really what caught our eye, as you can, uh, hopefully you can see there in the middle, right next to NAB is CR1. CR1 is a top Alzheimer's disease gene, and I've been in Alzheimer's disease genetics for about eight years, you know, working specifically with genomics data and I had never heard anyone uh, talk about CR1 being dark or camouflaged, and I had never noticed it either. Uh, so this was a, a real eye-opener for us and really what uh, spurred a lot of this work. And I'll talk a little bit more about CR1 here in a minute. I want to briefly focus on SMN1 and SMN2, uh, which are genes that are uh, known to cause spinal muscular atrophy, and they've also been implicated in amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis, or ALS. So SMN1 and SMN2 are over 90% camouflaged, by again, by each other. And what I'm showing in this figure is a histogram of coverage from a large data set known as the, from the NOMAD consortium. <clears throat> so this, this data set has uh, nearly 150,000 whole genomes and whole exomes, primarily exomes. And this is showing a, a histogram from their data of the coverage for this gene, SMN1. And the reason I'm showing this is that I want to just emphasize this isn't just a problem in some of our data. It wasn't a technical artifact from, from our sequencing. This is ubiquitous across all short read data sets. So SMN1 and SMN2 are nearly completely camouflaged. Similarly, CR1, again, as I mentioned, a really important gene in Alzheimer's disease, it's the top five gene, uh, over uh, approximately, or I guess exactly 20% of it is, is dark, or in this case, it's actually camouflaged. And what's unique about CR1 is it's camouflaged by itself uh, because within the gene, there's a tandem repeat of the C3B, C4B binding domain and according to HG38, it's repeated approximately three times, and uh, that creates the alignment issue that we previously discussed. So this was, you know, again, a real eye-opener for us. <clears throat> so 
Okay, hopefully, uh, you know, to this point, I've I've convinced you that there are, there are some you know holes, some dark and camouflaged regions that need to be addressed. So, what can we do about it? Um, well, there are kind of two approaches. Uh, one is is one that we came up with, with for existing short read data sets. And I'm just going to briefly describe that so that you're aware that it exists. But I want to emphasize that we consider it simply a band aid, um, and that we think long term, uh, long read and long range uh, sequencing approaches are the solution to this problem and others the, and the structural variance as we'll discuss. So briefly just describing our, our algorithm that we designed, we wanted to know with these really a large data sets that already exist from short read sequencing and more will continue to be uh, uh, created, you know, is there a way to rescue mutations from some of these regions? And the, we came up with a conceptually simple approach where basically, if we have uh, a region that is repeated in the genome, uh, as in, in this example, I'm showing exons 10, 18, and 26 within CR1 are repeated, all the, the reads get randomly from those exons, they get randomly assigned to those three exons with a mapping quality of zero uh, demonstrated by the transparent reads in, in figure B. <clears throat> Well, if we sort of trick the aligner and make it as though two of those three exons do not exist, we can then align all of the reads to just one of those exons. And we can then determine that, you know, we, we then get good mapping quality and we can call variants. So what we can then do is determine that a variant exists in one of these three exons. What we cannot tell you at this point is which exon that exists. But then you can follow up with other approaches to, to really zero in on that. Uh, so that's the, a basic you know, summary of that, that algorithm. We applied it to the Alzheimer's disease sequencing project, which is at the time we had access to 13,000 whole genomes and exomes. And we were able to rescue over 4,000 variants from those uh, samples. And again, because CR1 was a top uh, Alzheimer's disease gene that was camouflaged. We specifically interrogated that gene to see if there were any, you know, uh, I guess, you know, quote unquote, smoking guns, uh, you know, for Alzheimer's disease. And we did identify a 10 base pair frame shift deletion that is in uh, one of those three exons. And it's, it's very rare, uh, but uh, we found it in five Alzheimer's disease cases and zero controls. And since then, we've also found it in additional cases, and we're continuing to follow this up. So just again, it's just sort of a proof of principle that in these dark and camouflaged regions, there are important variants that we need to be, that, that we can't miss. We can't afford to miss them. So that's the, a brief description of our, our algorithm. But again, you know, we view the long read technologies as, as the real solution long term. So we wanted to know, you know, just how well do long read technologies address this problem? So <clears throat> we did a comparison uh, using standard Illumina sequencing with a 100 base pair read links as the baseline. And then we started to compare longer read technologies and how much of these dark regions are resolved with them. So the the three technologies that we are uh, that we that we compared are ten x genomics long uh, excuse me synthetic long read uh, technology, PAC bio and Oxford nanopore technologies, and what we found uh, and we're showing here in Figure B is that ten uh, x genomics it resolves approximately fifty percent of dark and camouflaged regions. Uh, relative to Illumina, standard Illumina sequencing. PacBio resolves about 64%. These numbers are, are inverted, showing how much of, how much of it re remains. <clears throat> so PacBio resolves about 64%. And Oxford Nanopore Technologies resolves uh, about 91% of these dark and camouflaged regions. Uh, really just demonstrating that these long-read technologies have a lot of value in, in resolving these regions. Uh, I should also just briefly highlight that 10X Genomics, their synthetic long read technology was unfortunately recently dis, uh, discontinued, which is, uh, you know, as I said, very unfortunate. But 
Um, here I wanted to, to demonstrate some, uh, some specific examples showing how these different technologies fare in some of these regions we discussed. So with SMN1 and SMN2, in the top, we're showing the large gaps that you would see based on standard Illumina sequencing. Uh, and in these regions, 10X Genomics resolves them very well with their synthetic long reads. And then PacBio also resolves the region but if you look at the histogram above the, the reads, you'll see that PacBio's uh, read depth does drop dramatically throughout the gene, in the middle of those genes. And then finally, Oxford Nanopore Technologies uh, resolves them uh, you know, you know, perfectly well, uh, where there is no drop in coverage in either of those, those genes. Uh, and then CR1, which is, you know, has, has become a favorite gene of mine, um, here showing again the top Illumina, you see these large gaps. Uh, 10X Genomics has zero effect on these regions. Uh, again, PacBio does resolve the regions, but the, the coverage does drop pretty dramatically in the middle. Uh, and then Oxford Nanopore Technologies also resolves this region with, with, uh, with pretty strong coverage throughout that region. And again, so this is just demonstrating some specific, specific examples where the long read technologies uh, resolve these regions. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, to this point, I've, I've talked about the first category of how long read and long, long range technologies help resolve dark and camouflaged regions. But how about the structural variants that we've discussed, and that we or that we mentioned? So, uh, I just want to briefly show some some unpublished data that that we have, where we first tested some targeted, deep targeted sequencing with PacBio on 20 subjects for 15 genes that are of interest to us. And uh, I wanted to highlight here, so th there are a lot of numbers on this slide where we're showing 12 of the 20 samples that we, that we sequenced in these 15 genes. And we're just, we just broke it up into the number of insertions and deletions, structural insertions and deletions that we observed in these genes in these individuals. And then we also broke it up into how many of them were de novo. I, uh, in other words, had never been observed before. And the take home number here, the message is in red in the lower right hand corner where we identified an average of 10.3 de novo structural mutations across these 15 genes per individual. And you know, that's a lot of structural mutations that have never been observed before from just 20 subjects that we selected. Uh, again, just highlighting that there are a lot, there's a lot of structural vari variation out there that is not being captured with short read technologies. Uh, and here I'm just showing a specific uh, long, uh, large deletion in the CV2AP gene, which is a, a top Alzheimer's disease gene. So I also wanted to briefly, um, or I guess, you know, so show uh, another technology that is that is optical DNA mapping from bionanogenomics that has a different uh, application. It, it's really uh, its its great strength is in the the extremely long DNA fragments and the ability to identify structural variants. Um, so what I'm showing here is just a, a view of their chip. Uh, so basically, uh, on on the on the lower figure. It shows a at the microscopic level how the technology works. So basically, they have these, they get you extract high molecular weight DNA, and that DNA gets, uh, or I should say, really long DNA fragments. And that DNA gets teased carefully into these long DNA, uh, or excuse me, nano channels that are about the width of a DNA strand. So I'm going to show a brief video showing uh, how this technology works, where you'll actually be able to see the DNA being carefully teased into these nanochannels.
So I really like that video. Uh, it's just uh, just a beautiful image showing how you know showing this technology. But let me highlight uh, some of the data that we've generated with this technology and, and the value of it. <clears throat> so we, uh, you know, in our efforts to test the technology ourselves, uh, we we selected some samples that we had access to, some brain samples um, that we wanted to test. You know, how well can this technology identify some known structural mutations or variants. And one of those is an al an, a known alpha-synuclein triplication that was implicated in Parkinson's disease years ago by Singleton and Ferrer et al. And <clears throat> this is a, a, a triplication that to our knowledge was, was described, but, had, but the, the haplotype structures had not been uh, characterized, or at least published, that we had seen. So, we, we had access to, to uh, brain tissue from one of these uh, subjects, and we ran that and uh, on the on the on the sapphire, the bio nano sapphire, and and as a, at a quick uh, a quick first pass, we just did a copy number variation analysis, and you can see that here, where uh, as we walk along, you see two copies of of the genome, and then. It quickly spikes, and we see four copies, and then it drops back down to two copies, and it's about a two megabase region. So it's it's a pretty large region. We immediately are able to identify that. So <clears throat> then we started to, you know, we dug in, and and what is really exciting about this technology is one that we can identify really large and complicated structural variants, but two that we can actually construct individual haplotypes. So in this case, we were able to construct both germline haplotypes from this individual. So what I'm showing, uh, the green horizontal bar, that indicates uh, chromosome 4 from the reference human genome, where alpha-synuclein is, which is indicated there in the middle. The top uh, horizontal blue line is the, the first haplotype that was constructed using the optical DNA mapping technology. And each blue hash on, on both bars indicates a motif that has been tagged, and that's how we are able to construct the structure of, of the haplotypes. Each gray line between those indicates an alignment. So comparing haplotype 1 to chromosome 4, all the, the gray lines are completely vertical, indicating that there is no uh, no structural rearrangement in this region. If we look at haplotype 2, however, we're showing just a portion where we see two inversions. And so we're able to see, based on this, that first of all, the first the, the, the one haplotype is completely normal. So the triplication all happened on a single haplotype. And, and the, we're also able to determine that while with all three being on the same, uh, haplotype, uh, two of those copies are actually inverted. So uh, this just really demonstrates, uh, is one great example of the power of this technology. Uh, another example that we tested was uh, using the C9R72 uh, G4C2 repeat expansion that is known to cause uh, uh, ALS and frontotemporal dementia. So we have uh, we had a case that has a really large expansion that's shown in this southern blot, indicated by the blue arrow, and we knew that the expansion was quite large. Uh, it was larger than 23 kilobases, but uh, you know, with with you know some of these older technologies, it's hard to be uh, really precise. So we wanted to see whether the sapphire is able to span and measure these extremely large repeat expansion expansions where no other technology has really been able to do this at the depth and consistency that the bio nano can that the sapphire can so again what i'm showing here the green bar indicates chromosome 9 where c9 or 72 uh, resides and then we actually were able to construct five different haplotypes showing various lengths of this expansion which we had suspected, and we also showed in a previous publication, that there is mosaicism of this expansion. In this case, it, the expansion is, exists in various sizes of repeats. And so we observed uh, everything from 1.9 kb 
expansion uh, up to a haplotype of 31.6 kb. When we looked at the individual DNA molecules, we actually observed one uh, molecule where the expansion was 45 kb, uh, just demonstrating how large of, a, of a, an expansion we're able to measure with this technology. Um, and, and I should, you know, point out, you, you cannot do that. You cannot size that with short read technology. It's simply not possible. <clears throat> um, so using CR1 as a, you know, another example, I, I alluded to the, uh, the region, the, the binding domain that is a tandem repeat. What I hadn't explained before is that this binding domain, uh, the, the number of times it's repeated is actually variable in the population, and the number of times it's repeated is associated with disease. So, you know, today, you know, there's, there has not been a good way to accurately measure the number of binding domains within an individual, and certainly not broken up by haplotype. But with this technology, we're able to do that. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to show the, the histocompatibility complex, which uh, houses the human antigen leukocyte genes, or the HLA genes. Uh, this region is, is genomically complex. There's a lot of variation uh, in the population here. This region has also been implicated with over 100 human diseases. But because of the genomic uh, complexity, it's been hard to really pin down what's happening. Well, with the, with the SAFIRE optical DNA mapping, we're able to construct complete haplotypes uh, throughout this entire region. And uh, part of what we're showing here are the red regions, which indicate uh, genomic variation from the human reference, so sequence that has not been observed in the human reference. So with that, you know, I just want to summarize, and you know, thank you for uh, you know joining me today. Um, I, what I hope I was able to 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 demonstrate is that there are some really important uh, regions of the human genome, be it from dark or camouflaged regions, uh, that are completely overlooked, or structural variants that are in regions that we are able to sequence uh, well, but that are overlooked again with short read technologies, and 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 hopefully demonstrate the value of these long read and long range technologies and what we can do with them. There are a lot of genes that are already known to be involved in disease that are uh, not being adequately interrogated uh, with the right technologies, um, or maybe I should say with all of the right technologies. And uh, that's what we're working on and uh, what we hope you know, we've convinced uh, you all of, the, of their utility. So again, thank you for joining me and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.